Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never cease, my love songs run aloud and praise. Teach me some melody and song, sung by friends in tongues above. what, if I'm the glue, we're, we're in trouble. I've never been called glue before. I'd like to read this morning from Isaiah chapter number 26, verses 8 and 9. Yea, in the way of thy judgments, O Lord, have we waited for thee. The desire of our soul is to thy name and to the remembrance of thee. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we love and praise you. Lord, we do look forward to what you're going to teach us this morning. Lord, just pray that you'd use clay in a mighty way. I know that we have some missing here this morning, Father. We just trust that you're going to take care of each and every one of them, Pastor and Miss Deb and many others, Father. And we just uh, Know that you're going to be lifted up in praise this morning, Lord. I pray that all of our hearts are right before you today and that we look in anticipation for your word today. Father, I pray that there's someone here this morning that uh, doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior. Pray that they'd get that right today, Lord. And we just lift everything up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, I think everybody knows... uh, Our Lindsay Chapel Christmas program is going to be tonight. Um, That's always a a fun time. That's going to be at 6 o'clock, so our regular evening service. So if you can bring a a neighbor, friend, family member, bring them with you, and uh, um, they will be blessed, I'm sure. And uh, and, uh, tell them they're going to get a candy sack afterwards. We can always use a little bribery, right? So if that works, um, if they like candy, that'll be a blessing too. Also, our, just want to, another reminder, our, our annual teen, Teenagers Christmas Party is going to be this next Saturday, December 12th at 530. That's going to be in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, um, we do the gift exchange deal, so bring a $10 gift. If you're a guy, bring a guy, guy gift. If you're a, a, a girl, bring a girl gift. And so uh, that's always a, a lot of fun playing that game, so they're going to be doing that. But you have to be 55 and older. Um, 50. Where did I get 55? I don't know where I got that. But you got to be 50 and older. I qualify either way, so it didn't matter to me. So anyway, uh, if you're 50 and older, mark that down on your calendar. It'll be a great time. All right. We uh, always want to uh, welcome our first-time visitors with us. And if this is your first time here to uh, worship with us, uh, we just ask you to hold your hand up for just a second so we can see where, you're, where you are, not where you are at. I know better than to say that. I almost said it. Well, I thought we had some new faces this morning. He's going back there like he's going to give that to somebody, but I don't think he is. Well, praise the Lord. Good to have you all with us this morning. There's one over there. I knew there was one. All right. Praise the Lord. Good to have you with us this morning. And uh, Brother <laughs> Gerald, come on. All 
All right, let's turn to page 142. Page 142, there is a fountain filled with blood. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners' blood beneath that blood lives all their guilty stains lives all their guilty stains lives all their guilty stains and sinners' blood beneath that blood lives all their guilty stains the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I though vile as he washed all my sins away wash all my sins One page to page 140. We'll sing Down at the Cross. And stand as we sing. Stand with me, please. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. the blood of life. 
remain standing if you will and uh, while the choir's getting seated we are going to be in numbers so you can take your Bible that direction before I get into the message though Jameson and Kristen who are pretty integral part of our um, program I just got the okay from Jameson so their baby could be getting here today now it could be tomorrow but she is in preliminary labor and uh, some of y'all know that that means our choir specials are going to be majorly affected. And uh, we will be having our Christmas program, though, as scheduled this evening. So do invite uh, your friends, if you've got some, to come and hear some Christmas music. And we will be giving out candy sacks tonight as well. Uh, we've got those laid out. And I do have a little negative news, and that is there is fruit in the candy sacks. It's not just candy. So... Uh, parents, if you got kids that you want to be healthy, give them the fruit and give the other one the candy. Amen. And then I did also want to mention, you notice that dad and mom are not here. Dad is doing great and feeling fine, but mom wasn't feeling great and he's home with her. So just uh, be praying for them as well. And uh, we want to go ahead and get into the message. And I hope you have your Bible. If you do, turn to Numbers 21. Normally I preach on Sunday nights except for one Sunday a month. This is not my Sunday, but since Dad's gone, I'm preaching tonight's message this morning. How many of you have been here on Sunday nights? Okay, the vast majority of you. And we have been going through, not a series, because I don't want to have a never-ending series, amen. But we have been going through Old Testament stories, some Old Testament characters, individuals, and kind of highlighting some Bible stories that you may not be familiar with from the Old Testament. The reason this is important, Paul told the church at Corinth that the things written aforetime are written for us. Although not everything written in the Old Testament is written to us, it is all good for us. Amen? And so we are going to look uh, this morning at one of my favorite stories, and I think an interesting story. This morning's message, and I believe it will fit right in with this time of year as well as we're thinking about Christmas and, and uh, things like that. But the message is going to be the snake on the stick. And, and that is not, listen, that's the title of the message. It's not uh, something off the menu of the deep fried state fair booth, amen? Although they may have that. But we will be looking at Numbers 21, if you will look there with me. And we'll read a few verses and get right into the message this morning. Numbers 21, and I'll start at verse 4. It says, and they journeyed, that is the children of Israel, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Eden, Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have ye brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread." And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I thank you for this passage that we have here. And God, as we look at your dealings with your people in the Old Testament, I pray that you'd help us to have ears to hear and that we would make application to our lives today is our prayer. My prayer for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here, is that they would, Lord, be encouraged and edified by your word, that they would be built up, and that they would be better equipped for the work of the ministry, is my prayer. God, I pray that someone here this morning 
is not saved, if there's a person in our midst that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that your Holy Spirit would reveal that to them and then this morning they would turn their eyes to you, Lord, in faith and be saved. And Lord, above all, we want you to be exalted, lifted up, glorified, and praised and honored. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for your blessings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. The Old Testament, we started a series, and I do say that more importantly uh, to me than just getting my congregation to a place where they can win Bible trivia in Old Testament category, more important to me than that is that we see uh, Christ because the Bible makes it clear that all of history is really the story of Christ. And what we find revealed to us in the New Testament accounts of the Gospels is Jesus Christ revealed. Yet when we take the Word of God, we find that He is both prophesied, foretold, and we see Him in some ways concealed, and we see pictures of Christ. If we really study and begin to uncover things in the Old Testament, we find Jesus. Jesus told the Pharisees that it is the scriptures which testify of me, he said. And this is another example in Numbers 21. Where we find ourselves is in a transition. The children of Israel have been freed from bondage in Egypt. Yet upon getting to the border of the promised land, they did not want to go in. They sent spies for 40 days. And upon receiving a negative report... The majority of the people griped and grumbled and complained. And the Bible says that, that they said it would be better if we just die in the wilderness than go into this promised land. And God said that's what's going to happen. Forty days the spies were in. For 40 years you're going to wander in the wilderness till all of you are dead. 20 years old and over. Everybody that did not want to go into the promised land is going to die in the wilderness. And that's where we find ourselves. They are in this period where now they are traveling. By the way, God is still leading them. They still have the tabernacle. They have a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. They have God's protection. They have His divine provision. They are being fed the bread of heaven, manna from heaven, every day. And the recurring problem that these people have is they gripe and grumble and complain. And so we see something in Numbers 21 that really is somewhat startling. In previous episodes of griping and complaining, there would be a punishment foretold. There would be Moses and God and the people. And many times there would be, for example, one of the last episodes we saw where God told Moses, hey, just move over and I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses interceded and said, oh, no, God, don't do that. What's interesting is this time the Bible says they spoke against God and Moses and God sent fiery serpents amongst them. Now, I think there's a God-given natural tendency a fear in the human race towards snakes. Now, that's not universal. My sister-in-law, Sarah, she would always act like she'd just eat a bug or pick up a snake or she just wasn't scared of very much. But most people generally draw back, don't we, at the sound of a serpent or the sight of a snake. And this is what the Bible says, that serpents, fiery serpents, verse 6, were sent among the people and they bit the people and much people of Israel died. So snake bites, serpents biting the people. Now, the reason we set the scene here, the reason these people were griping and, and groaning, it should be noted, the Bible says they were discouraged. They were much discouraged because of the way. Now, it says they had to go all the way around the land of Edom because when they asked Edom, which that's Esau's kin, folks, these were distant relatives. They said, hey, we'll stay by the king's highway. We want to just travel through the land of Edom. And they said, no, you won't. And they came out against them to fight them. Now, that was probably discouraging. But also they had just buried Miriam and Aaron, that two of the central figures in Israel's deliverance from Egypt had died. And really one thing after another had seemed to happen to them. They had been turned back to go into the wilderness. And I, let's be honest, if you knew that the way you were going was really nothing more than an extended death penalty, 40 years of wandering, wouldn't it be easy to get discouraged? And these folks did get discouraged. Do you know that just because you belong to the Lord doesn't mean you don't get discouraged? 
But we ought to take note, church, that we should, well, listen, we should never allow, allow a discouraged heart to give us a distorted view of God and His provision and protection for us. But that's what happened. So this morning there's three key details in this story that we're going to kind of emphasize. And the first is the curse, the problem, the snakes. Right? I mean, He sent fiery serpents because of their griping and grumbling. And He sent them right away, straight away. And this was deadly, fiery serpents. I think one reason they're not given much warning is because they had seen a lot by this time. Do you know the Bible says there's a principle to much is given, much is required? The more knowledge you have, the more responsible you are. And at this time, if the people did not know at this point that grumbling and griping against God and Moses was a bad idea, they were not very good students. I mean, this, <laughs> I mean how did they get into this mess? By griping and grumbling and complaining against God. Moses and God, and now they do that again. They, they laid a complaint against God, and this should be noticed, n- noted that even when we're discouraged and things aren't going good, we ought to be careful because a spirit of murmuring and a spirit of complaining always is a reflection of our view of God. You may say, well, I would never speak against God. Well, if you get down in the mouth about circumstances, you're just walking a very fine line between what the children of Israel did and what you think you're doing. You think you're just airing out your complaint. And by the way, when we're down, it is okay. If we're discouraged, we should take our complaint to the Lord. We should listen. David at many Psalms are laments where he's crying out to God. But listen, there's a difference in crying out to God and crying out against God. And these people complained against God. Paul warned New Testament believers in 1 Corinthians 10.10, listen, based on this very same time period in Israel's history, using that as a a background, as a text, Paul warned the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10. He said, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed, of the destroyer. Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without murmuring and disputings or complaining. Do all things. I'll just be real honest. After I've studied this week and, and in years past, I just don't believe there's any place in the life of a believer for griping and complaining. There's just not really any place. It's hard to give thanks in everything, be thankful for everything. It's hard to... Uh, like last week we preached on Thanksgiving, it's hard to have a thankful heart and gripe and complain at the same time. Amen? And listen, the Lord loves cheerfulness. The Lord, listen, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. Those things are not real compatible with a sour, fault-finding, complaining attitude. So God judged them. The curse that He sends upon them, I think, is somewhat fitting. Do you know the Bible says in Romans 3, uh, verse 10, a passage that some of you are familiar with, but it's interesting when listing, when talking about the sinfulness of man and pointing out some of our problems as mankind, listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. He said, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way, they are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Isn't this interesting? He says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. He goes on to talk about their feet being swift. But when Paul talks about the sinfulness of man, the first practical example he gives is the tongue, our mouth. And he says this... Speaking of sinners, he says the poison of serpents is under their lips. And it just seems ironic to me that these people who are pouring out poison from their mouth now are in danger of getting bitten by a poisonous serpent themselves. It's almost uh, poetic, the justice here. Something else that I think is interesting, I, I wouldn't just stand up and say this is the way it is. The Bible says they were fiery serpents. 
But do you know that history records in secular sources that in the area of Palestine and the area of Israel and the Sinai Peninsula, that there are reports, listen, even as late as the time of Christ, of flying fiery serpents. And by the way, we've got, these, these are real critters. We've got them in the fossil records. You may say, oh, well, those are dinosaurs and they lived millions of years ago. Well, I can tell you this. They, um, you might want to call them dinosaurs. They didn't live millions of years ago. They were created by God. And listen, Isaiah says in Isaiah 14, verse 29, that there was a fiery flying serpent. Now, I don't know if that was the case, but I do think that would be the height of irony that they're complaining. Listen, do you know when they wanted meat when they were in the wilderness, God brought it on the wing, right? He'd send quail in. They, listen, their food every morning from the sky, the manna that would collect on the ground, and yet now their judgment comes flying in in the form of a servant, a serpent. So... God had sent provision in the past. He now sends punishment. And it really was a frightening curse. Whether, listen, any kind of serpent scares me, amen? I, for a long time, I was of the opinion that any good snake was a dead snake. I see a lot of heads shaking. That's like, yep. I will be honest at this point. Once I, in high school, I became convinced that not all snakes were poisonous. Okay, although I've got friends in Mexico who do not believe that. But... I mean, I've literally picked up a garter snake in Mexico and everybody acted like I was taking my life into my own hands. And I said, look, he doesn't even have any fangs. He'll sting you with his tail. I'm like, come on, guys. I had that, uh, that happen. It was a crazy situation. But I became convinced that not all snakes were poisonous, but I still draw back when I see one, amen. I don't kill black snakes if they're in the hay barn because I figure they're killing the rats, amen. Amen. There's no reason to kill them. But it would be a, a scary sight to think of a camp. Listen, that means these people, they were intense. They didn't have the kind of buildings like we do. That, and even, listen, even in modern day America, some of the most secure buildings, it's not Im completely impossible to think that a snake might crawl in. But can you imagine in a tent city being infiltrated with poisonous serpents. And listen, these serpents were on a mission. This wasn't just like some old rattlesnake. Listen, when I worked in Mexico, I used to walk up on the hill behind the ranch and every morning, listen, the first morning I did that as the sun was coming up, I thought, I'm wondering if I'm hearing like a little gas leak over here. Oh, it sounds like a little gas leak over here. Wait, it sounds like there's just little sprinklers or leaks or something all over this hill. Well, no, what they are is in the morning as the rattlesnakes wake up, they start waking up and they, the sun starts shining and they start going. And that whole hillside, you just, if you're quiet and there's nothing going on, you can just hear them all over that hillside. Now that was always a little bit unnerving to me. But do you know what I knew? I knew that most of them old snakes, they'd go out of their way to avoid me. Apparently that wasn't the case with these critters. This was a curse, a judgment sent by God, and they were biting people. They were, that was what they were there to do. And so that brings us to the next detail of the story. We understand the curse, the serpent, but the cure. See, they go to Moses, and you've got to also note that this is one of the most frank and honest repentances that the people have because they immediately turn and they get right to the point. They cry out to Moses and they say... We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. That's exactly what they had done. And then they ask Moses, pray, pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Once again, Moses is the intercessor. He's going between the people and God and coming to the people on behalf of God. And as he intercedes for them, God speaks. The Bible says, and the Lord said unto Moses, but I will have to admit this is one of the most odd prescriptions you could ever find. Here Moses had a prayer of supplication, of intercession, and here God gives a prescription. Moses, he says, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass. 
and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, isn't this interesting? Now, as I was studying this, this, this picture of a snake on a pole, we know that picture, don't we? Have you all seen that picture before? Now, I know some of you may be a little bit well studied up on the idea or the topic of a snake on a stick. That's a medical symbol. Are you all aware of that? Medical symbol. There, there's two. There's one that they call the caduceus. Now, that's, uh, that's a stick with intertwining snakes, and it's got, like a set of wings at the top. How many of you all have seen that? Okay. And most uh, the sources that I read believe that that was a mistake, that what the symbol that they were shooting for, most medical establishments and most symbols, was a single staff. Sometimes it even looks like a shepherd's staff with a single snake, which was referred to as the rod of Asclepius. Now, both of those terms that I'm using are borrowed from mythology, Roman or Greek mythology. But they both are accepted today as symbols of healing. I, and I think that's interesting because nothing about a snake on a stick makes me think, ooh, that's where I want to go if I'm not feeling good, right? But can I just say that, without getting too deep into, into paganism, but though I believe that the origin even of those symbols and those myths are not uh, paganism. I believe the origin of that is what we're reading about. When God asked Moses to take a brass serpent and put it on a pole and raise it for the healing of the nation of Israel. Now, I believe you have history, because by the way, this was over 1,400 years before Christ. And by contrast, like Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey, that's like four to 500 years before Christ. So you've got a 1,000 years before, you know, when this happens, before some of those pictures emerge in mythology. And I believe it's just a deterioration, a perversion of true history. And so it doesn't diminish the truth of Scripture. It actually confirms the truth of Scripture. There was a stick with a snake on it that brought healing. And we're reading about it. But isn't that an odd prescription that God gives him? What a cure! The people say, hey, we've sinned, we've messed up, could you just take the snakes away? And it could be that God either immediately or in process of time did take the serpents away, but the cure he prescribed was very odd. He said, you got a snake problem, make a snake, Moses. And Moses made a snake out of brass. Now, brass is something that they had. Brass was, by the temple, they primarily used three metals, gold, silver, and brass. Brass was the strongest of those options. Do you know that the altar was covered in brass? It was a brazen altar. In Exodus 38, you'll find that most of the temple instruments were brass. So they knew, they had and they knew how to use and make stuff out of brass. And apparently this didn't take a long time. Moses got on the stick, and I don't know if he used uh, Bezalel or some of the... But he said, hey, they've asked us, God's, they've asked us for healing. God's told us here's how it's going to happen. And so he makes a fiery serpent out of brass. And then he lifts it up on a pole. Now, it had to be on a pole, and I don't believe it was just a stick that he held in his hand. It was a pole that could be erected high enough that anybody that was bit could see it. That's what the Bible says. Now, this tent city could have had over a million people in it, so I'm assuming this was a pretty large snake and a pretty tall pole, right? Because if the cure was anybody that's bitten anywhere in the camp, if they'll look at this pole... So I'm assuming this was a pretty tall pole. Like, listen, one of the center poles in the tabernacle would have been very, very tall. They had the potential of having poles 30, 40 foot tall. I have no doubt this snake was lifted up high. And then get this. The cure, there's no, listen, no essential oils. I know some of you think, hey, I've got an essential oil that will cure snake bite. Some of our ladies, right? Yeah. I mean, listen, I've heard two uh, testimonials, uh, sales pitches for, I mean, you can get run over by a truck, and if they get the right oil out, you'll be fine, right? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> 
And it better work that good because that stuff's worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Amen. But it wasn't, isn't this interesting? It's no oil they had to apply. There was no herb they had to ingest. Listen, there was no process they had to go through. We've been bit by a snake. Why? Well, because we were talking against God and against Moses and he sent serpents and we're bit. What's the cure? Snake on a pole. That's the cure. Well, what do we have to do? All you have to do is look at it. Looking at it. Yep. You look at it and you're healed. Now, by the way, I don't think some brass item lifted up high. And by the way, if I'm ailing and dying, probably going out in the sunlight and looking up into the sky is not what I'm going to want to do. But there was no medicinal properties in the brass snake. Interesting note. Do you know over 700 years later, there was a king in Israel whose name was Hezekiah? And he loved God and he hated idolatry. And as he was tearing down idols and breaking stuff up, do you know what he destroyed? This brass snake that Moses built. The Bible says he took the brass serpent that Moses had built and he took it down and he broke it in pieces. And he said it was Nehushtan, which just meant it's just brass. That's, I point that out because... Hezekiah became grieved. They were burning incense and worshiping the snake on the stick. That means that Israel had carried this stick with them, had brought it into the promised land, and had erected it somewhere where Hezekiah knew exactly where it was, and there was worship going on towards the snake on the pole. The snake on the pole, listen, that brass item was not magical. It didn't have healing properties. Hezekiah said it was just brass. But God determined that the healing hand of the Lord would be on those that looked at the serpent, those that didn't would not be healed. Isn't that crazy? Like that's the prerequisite. That's it. What's the condition for healing? Well, you have to eat vegetables. Nope. How do you get better? Well, you got to promise to turn over a new leaf. Nope. What if you were one of the main gripers and grumblers and complainers? How did you, what did you have to do to get healed? Same thing as everybody else. Had to look up at the snake. Isn't that an interesting story? He said, those that looked at the snake lived. When he looketh upon it, God said, he shall live. And so Moses made it. And it said, when any man, if any man had been bitten, when he beheld the serpent of brass, comma, he lived. Interesting story, isn't it? And those are the two main details, but that's not where the story ends. How many of you remember a New Testament reference to this passage? If you would go to John chapter 3, because this is the most important part of the story. This is the connection part. Do you know that Jesus is found in the Old Testament? Do you know the Bible says that when they followed Moses and they ate the bread from heaven, do you know Jesus said, I'm the bread from heaven? Did you know that? Jesus is referenced not just as, as the rock. He's the rock that was smitten. So when Moses smote the rock, Christ was there. The living water that flowed from the rock, Christ is the living water. We see Jesus depicted as high priest. He is our holy place. He is our sacrifice. He's all in the Old Testament. But do you know that Jesus very specifically referenced himself regarding one Old Testament story to the man Nicodemus. Now you know John 3. John 3.16, almost all of us could quote that. But what does John 3.16 rest on? What does, Jesus say, what does Jesus say right before John 3.16? Verse 11 of John 3, Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, He said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John 3 14 and 15, Jesus says, as Moses lifted up that snake. Nicodemus knew the story. Jesus didn't have to expound it, but he basically was saying, Nicodemus, 
Remember when the whole congregation got snake bit and they were dying? I mean, in essence, Nicodemus knew what was going on when Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the snake. There was no ambiguity. He knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. And he says, Nicodemus, just like Moses lifted up that snake, so the one that came from heaven, God in the flesh, God the Son, the Son of God, the Son of Man who is in heaven, must be lifted up. Just like the snake. And then he says something that's amazing, that whoever believes in him. I'll be real honest. Do you know over the years, I've gotten grief from time to time about the gospel. We do, when we do prison ministry, you got to understand, even when we were doing um, every week prison services, we were doing it four times a month at McAllister and once a month in uh, Jess Dunn. Uh, even those guys that got to know us really well, do you know what they would have to encounter? They would have to encounter services on Sunday that didn't tell the truth, services on Monday that didn't preach the gospel, services on Tuesday, a lot of times. Am I right? This is what happened. And then come Thursday, our service comes, and we did the best we could to preach the Word of God. And occasionally we would have a little opposition or contention. I mean, I, I remember having somebody come up to me and they said, you believe you can just believe in Jesus and, be, and go to heaven? I said, yeah, that's right. That's what I believe. <laughs> and, you know, I, I remember there were certain groups that would indoctrinate those guys that it's not that simple. That, I mean, there's a formula. And you got to go to our group and you got to have our guy do this to you and you got to do it this way and you got to talk this way and you got to go to church on this day and you got to worship in this way and if you leave any of these things out, you're damned. Amen. Did y'all know that there's churches that that's what they're based on? I mean, they've got a list of do's and don'ts. There's a list of sacraments that you got to follow. There's a list, a list of rings you got to jump through and it's pretty complicated getting to heaven. It's not that easy. And it would seem interesting to me that the Pharisees, who by the way were in the same trap, even after Christ came and many believed on Him, do you know that the rise of Judaism in the church continued to drag the church back into a system of legalism? Where, yeah, it's Jesus, but you've got to stay kosher. Yeah, it's Jesus, but you've got to keep the Jewish ceremonial law. Yeah, it's Jesus, but you've got to do this and you've got to do that. Something Paul battled against in New Testament churches repeatedly. And yet here, Jesus talking to a Pharisee, he makes a connection that I don't believe Nicodemus had ever seen before. See, what Jesus said is that serpent, there's more going on here. Just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man be lifted up. What were the, what were the commonalities? What was the, the parallels between Jesus and the snake? First of all, can I just point this out? The serpent that Moses lifted up was not poisonous. Did you know that? He was made out of brass. There was no venom in it. It was all brass, right? But it was... Formed, It had taken on the form of a serpent. That brass, listen, I have no doubt. Where did the brass come from? Well, it was the same brass that was used for the sanctified instruments in the temple. The very same stuff. The same stuff that was made to carry the ark. The same stuff that was made for that altar where people could come and get right with God. That brazen altar, those brazen instruments, it was the same stuff that that was made out of, yet this time it had taken on the form. It had been formed into a serpent. Do you know the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant? That being, listen, he was completely God. And yet, listen, this is why I think this is a fitting time to preach this message. Do you know that, that we ought to be quick? And by the way, I hope nobody here is confused. We have never taught, nor do I believe that Jesus was most definitely born on December 25th. Are you all okay with that? I mean, if you said, well, what if we get to him and find out he was? Well, okay, great. But I don't believe there's any scriptural merit for me demanding that this is the day that Jesus was born. Are you all okay with that? Amen. But this is one thing I do know. He was born. Amen. And do you know what the incarnation was? The incarnation was, listen... Even more so than the cross, the incarnation was the humiliation of 
Christ, the Son of God. Because He came in the form of sinful man. And the Bible puts it this way in Philippians. And by the way, this is why we should be humble of heart and mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, 5. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a serpent, servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, Jesus wasn't a servant. He was the Lord of lords and the King of kings, but he became a servant. He was found in fashion as a man. John 1 says... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14 says, and the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh. The Eternal One, the Immortal One, took on Himself mortality. Why did He do that? Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Do you know what Paul says in Romans? The reason we don't have to fear condemnation, the reason we're free from the law, he says, is that God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Do you know why Jesus was our perfect mediator and our perfect sacrifice? Because He was like us. He was made like us. Do you know why He can comfort the brokenhearted? Do you know why He can, listen, give strength to the tempted? Because He's walked in our shoes. That's what the Bible says. He came, listen, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. But what happened when Jesus came in the form? What happened when He came as a man? What happened when He became the second Adam? Because He was in the form of sinful flesh, yet without sin, the Bible says He condemned sin in the flesh. He became the cure. Coming in the form of sinful man, He forever cured man from sin. And in the same way, listen, as Moses was... Can you imagine them beating that or stretching that, forming that? I don't know, maybe if they already had... Uh, I'm just thinking the brass, they would heat it, it would be purified, it would also become uh, pliable, and they would begin to either forge that and, and, and hit that and knock that into the position they wanted it to be, or maybe they got it hot enough that they could impress upon that. I don't know, you know, in my mind I'm thinking, I wonder if they killed a snake the biggest fiery serpent and laid it in some damp sand and pressed it in there and then forced that hot brass to conform to that. And you know, there's multiple ways you can get an image uh, made into metal. You can be, it can be conformed that way. But the fact is this brass had been formed to look like the serpent so that it could cure people who'd been bitten by the serpent. See, there's something similar with that, with Christ. He came and went through what we've gone through. He was tempted in all manners, just like we are yet without sin. See, He took the curse. Galatians chapter 3, if you've got your Bible, and I hope you're making note or turning to these places, because as I got into this more and more, it became real exciting. Galatians 3.10 says, For as many as are of as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. By the way, do you know that if you think you can be good enough to get to heaven? You can. But you know what the standard is? If you say, I want to be good enough. Because, by the way, a lot of people misunderstand this. Jesus said there's two ways to heaven. People say, whoa, 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 tap the brakes. When the rich man, rich young man asked Jesus, the rich young ruler asked Jesus, what did he have to do to have eternal life? Do you know what Jesus said? Keep the commandments. By the way, can I just point out, if you perfectly keep the commandments, you're guaranteed a spot in heaven. Jesus would not have said it if it were not true. Right? One problem with that. Can anybody keep the commandments? 
No, do you know why he told... The rich young ruler thought he was good. What Galatians says, if your goodness depends on you keeping the law, then one violation curses you. One violation curses you. All it takes is one. How many sins do you have to commit to be a sinner? Just one. And listen, he says... As many as are under, if you want to be under the law, then you need to understand, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But then Paul says this, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith, and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Isn't that interesting? Do you know that, that the Israelites, the Hebrews, they honored, they honored the dead? In a sense, they understood that being dead, a physical body being dead, was kind of like being asleep. And therefore, they buried people. Abraham did. To take a dead body and to suspend it between heaven and earth, to hang somebody was a cursed way to die. I think we even had remnants of that in American history, right? Like the Judge Roy Bean and Judge Parker and the hanging, they'd hang them high. You didn't get hung high to, to celebrate and honor you, amen? You got hung high as a testimony. You don't want to be like this. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. See, that serpent was lifted between heaven and earth so that all those bitten would look at it. It's true, you know, the devil is a snake. Amen? He's first introduced in the garden. He came like a serpent. But can I tell you something? The snake's venom, the snake's bite is a part of mankind's curse. Do You know, Jesus told the Pharisees that we're spiritually, we're not children of God. Do You know, as sinners that speak evil and listen, spiritually there's only two families children of God, and Jesus said, you, speaking to the Pharisees in the book of John, you do the deeds of your father, the devil. Now that's strong language, amen? But Jesus takes on him the form of a man. And listen very carefully to me. Jesus wasn't snake bit, but we are, right? And so for us, that snake bruised his heel on the cross. He died. He took our sin. In this picture, when the Bible says, as Jesus saying, just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, in that, if you want to call it a picture of Christ, guess who the snake bit masses are? Us. We're all snake bit. If you were bit by the snake... You didn't die instantly. That was clear. But you would die. Okay, so this was a venom. By the way, I went through a class one time. I think we went on a homeschool field trip. And we had a safety demonstration by some wildlife department guy. And he talked about the water moccasin. I believe it was the water moccasin. And I, by now, I've, it is a long time ago. It might have been the copperhead. But I think it was the water moccasin. If you're bit by that Oklahoma venomous snake... He said a little rule of thumb is from the time you're bit to the time you lose control of some of your bodily functions, you've got about that much time left of consciousness. Wouldn't that be a fun thing to keep track of? <laughs> wow, I got bit and five minutes later I wet myself. I'm going to be gone in five more minutes. I don't know how long the snake bite took to kill people. But it was a death sentence. You know, it could be that not everybody got the exact same amount of time from the time they were bit to the time they were died. The Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die. I don't know, you may live 80 years or you may live 18 years, but life's a vapor either way. We're all snake bit. We're all on death row. And here's the beautiful thing about this story. The cure is simply... Christ lifted up. That's what he says. Do you know what real evangelism is? Real evangelism is not having the kind of personality that can talk people into stuff because you can't talk someone into conversion. Real evangelism is simply, listen, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, pointing people to Christ Jesus. 
That's evangelism. Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And there he is, crucified, lifted up. And he is our cure. And what is the, what is the application that he makes to Nicodemus? He says, Nicodemus, it's like that snake back there in Numbers. In Numbers 21, that snake that was lifted up, that's, that's how it is. That's, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up and whoever believes on Him. Listen, think about that. That means you can have pretty weak faith, but if you believe on the right thing, Jesus Christ, you can be saved. Do you know it's not the strength of your faith that saves you? It's the object of your faith. Amen? Listen, there's some very devout people who are full of faith in the wrong thing. Amen? You telling me that the cults don't have people that have a lot of faith? Sure, a lot of them have enough faith. They'll die for their cause. But if they're wrong, if they're wrong, then their faith is misplaced. But if you come to Christ, you don't have to do it. He has already finished the work. And all you have to do is believe it to receive it. Isn't that awesome? Listen, can you imagine the, the word passing? And listen, people are rolling around and they're trying to suck the poison out and doing tourniquets. I mean, listen, they had some common sense, I'm sure, treatments in the camp already. Snakes were already something they knew about. But no matter what they did, they died. They got bit, they died. Before long, listen, word began to pass around, hey, you don't have to die there's a cure. Really, what's the cure? Well, it sounds crazy, but up there in, in, in the sunlight, if you, just, if you just take a glimpse up above the camp, there's a pole and there's a snake on that pole. Moses made a snake. If you'll just grab mom and pop out and let them look at it, they'll be cured. They'll be healed. Well, that's silly. How would that work? I mean, how would that work? Well, I don't know. But I was bit. And I was sick, and I'm fine now. And I'm telling you, if you'll just let them look at that pole, and they'll be fine. They'll live. Well, they're dying. Yeah, I know. And that's why, listen, it's imperative. Time is short. The pole ain't going anywhere. By the way, it was there 700 years later. But I'm telling you, time is short, and it's time they need to get out and look at the pole. They need to turn their eyes towards heaven and look at the provision that God has made. You see, Moses put a brass serpent on a pole, and if you look on it, you'll be healed. Now, what does that have to do with us? It's the same principle that we direct people to Christ. Listen, if you'll turn your eyes to Christ Jesus, the sinless Son of God, who is made in the form of man. Listen, I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That last verse says, He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Can I tell you something? There were probably people snake bit who said, you know what, all my life I've had mishaps. By the way, some of us are more accident prone than others. Amen? Amen? Listen, there was a time growing up where the people at the ER knew me on a first name basis. Amen? I get stitches and, and get... I mean, I, y'all, some of y'all laughing, I had busted my nose open with a scope... Like, you know, people made fun of me for that. But if it ain't one thing, it's the other. I'm always getting beat up. Do you know what's interesting about this whole cure thing? Do you know that if you were in tip-top shape and got bit by these snakes, it appears to me that you're going to die. And you know, if you had been a snake handler and had been bit 20 times and then one of these snakes bit you, you were going to die. But it didn't matter whether you were previously healthy or previously ill, if you looked at the serpent on the stick, the Bible says you would live. You would live. You know what I think is odd? Sometimes people, they seem to put conditions on the gospel when they point out how bad they've been or everything they've been through. Some of us have been through a lot. Some of us have been through relatively little. But can I tell you something? If you're here and you're lost, Jesus knows every sorry thing that's ever happened to you. He knows every sin you've ever committed. And the Bible says, he that knew no sin became sin for us. And you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven by simply turning your eyes in faith to Jesus. You can receive forgiveness. You can live. You don't have to die. 
Listen, the death that we're worried about is not this physical body going to temporary rest. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For a believer, we don't have to be fearful of the valley of the shadow of death. Amen. We don't have to fear evil because God's with us. But the Bible says in Revelation, I believe chapter 20, 22, there at the end, it says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Anyone whose names were not found written in the Lamb's book of life were cast into the lake of fire. And you know what the Bible says? This is the second death. It's been said that if you're only born once, you'll die twice. But if you're born twice, you only have to die once. What does that mean? Well, Jesus told Nicodemus that except a man be born again. Do you know the moment you put a look of faith in the direction of Jesus Christ, the moment you receive that forgiveness He offers, the Bible says you're born again. New life starts and you don't have to die. See, you've been delivered from death. You've been saved. And if you've never had the gospel explained, if you're here this morning and you'd say, you know what, I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven. Listen, some of you may be here and you're not regularly with us and maybe you're not even a church person. You were just invited and that's why you're here and you don't have any confidence that you've really trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. Can I just point out to you this morning that He did come. He did die. He died for you and He rose again. And if the Holy Spirit touches your heart, you can turn to Him in faith and He'll save you. I'm going to have Megan come to the piano. We're going to close the service. Here at Lindsay Chapel, we have a time of invitation, but the truth is I can't invite anybody. The invitation is offered by Christ Jesus. But He says, anybody that's weary and heavy laden, they can come to Me and I'll give you rest. Have you put your eyes on Jesus? I'd like you to stand with me, please. I'd like your heads bowed and your eyes closed. This is not a time that we would try to make you do something that's not legitimate. I'm not pushing for an emotional decision. I'll tell you this, though. The more I read about Christ, I get a little emotional about it. You know why He died? He died for me. You know why He died? He died for you. And all you have to do is turn to Him. Look at Him. All that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's that one glimpse of faith that can save your soul. And if you're saved, but you're still struggling with the effects of snake bite, if you will, would you turn to Christ? Would you look at Christ, cry out to Him? Listen, the same forgiveness that saves us, that gives us that relationship with God, it can restore our fellowship when we've sinned. If you need to come this morning, the altars are open. If you need to talk to somebody, I can meet you right here. Christians are praying. Nobody's looking around. Are you saved this morning? Are you a believer? Are you willing to follow Jesus? You may say, Clay, I've done a lot of things in my life. I don't have a very good resume. I've done a lot of bad things. You're a perfect candidate for salvation. Amen. You cannot out the grace of God. But you do have to turn to Christ. It's time to stop looking down and it's time to stop looking at yourself and it's time to stop and look at Christ. He died to save you. We're not going to go long. But if you need to come, this time is for you. Are you saved? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you following Jesus? That'd be a real important step to take. If you don't come, you'll close the invitation after this verse. Jesus loves you. Can I tell you, if you're like me, you've got friends, you've got family, you've probably got neighbors be real honest, maybe we've slacked off. We need to lift Christ up, amen? We need to lift Him up so they'll be drawn to Him. Thank you, Megan. I sure appreciate your attentiveness. Thank you for listening. And and, uh, man, during this time,